Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Neil Love from Research to Practice, and welcome to Inside the Issue. It's a day we talk about the current and future management of high-risk non-metastatic prostate cancer. We have a great faculty today, Dr. Neil Shore from the Carolina Urologic Research Center in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, and Dr. Mary Ellen Taplin from the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston. We also have other uh, investigator faculty members who filled out a survey that we're going to show you later, and we're very grateful for them for their participation. As always, if you have any cases or questions you'd like to run by us, just type them into the chat room. We'll talk about as many of these as we have time. As we do in all our webinars, uh, we put out a one-minute pre- and post-meeting survey in the chat room for you to take. If you take that, you'll get more out of this, and we'll learn a little bit more about you. We do webinars all the time now. We just did a webinar a couple weeks ago on bispecifics and multiple myeloma this coming Wednesday, bispecific and non-Hodgkin lymphoma, particularly follicular lymphoma and uh, diffuse large B cell, really an exciting advance there. Then on August the 8th, we'll be doing a program on metastatic pancreatic cancer, talking about the big Nalyri Fox study presented on uh, first-line therapy of metastatic pancreatic cancer. Then on August the 10th, uh, we'll be visiting uh, Professor Long in Australia, uh, talking about the management of melanoma. We have some great cases presented on video for her to check out. If you're into audio programs, check out our Oncology Today podcast series, including a program, recent program on prostate cancer with Dr. Yu. But today we're here to talk about one of the most exciting and fast developing areas in uh, the management of cancer. Uh, the local advance and uh, uh, biochemical relapse. And I met with Dr. Shore uh, recently and recorded a presentation which goes through a lot of the data sets, but in much more detail. Uh, so that's in the chat room. We'll also send that out when we send out this webinar. It's really great to be able to check out the presentation and then see what we have to say on this webinar and what you have to say in the chat room. In this presentation, he goes through some of the key uh, data sets related to this uh, issue, uh, particularly the uh, PRESTO trial, of course, as well as the EMBARC study just presented at the recent uh, AUA meeting by Dr. Shore, in addition to a number of other papers, including the STAMPEDE study, uh, one of the arms there relevant to our topic here today. We're going to start out talking a little bit about sort of an interdisciplinary management of prostate cancer particularly for the kinds of patients that we're talking about today. And uh, Mary Ellen, this is really uh, in the community, really sort of the interface, I think, between medical oncology and urologists. I'm curious uh, how you approach these patients, the earlier stage patients at Dana-Farber. I know you're very interdisciplinary oriented, but who actually uh, makes the decision and treats the patient systemically? You know, gynecologic cancers, uh, certainly gynecologic oncologists in the United States are using chemo, systemic therapy. In Europe, uh, they don't. Uh, what are you doing at uh, Dana-Farber? Uh, thanks, Neil. Uh, we, we have a lot of multidisciplinary clinics. When the patient first comes to the Dana-Farber, try to set them up to see um, all three disciplines, urology, medical oncology, and radiation oncology. Generally, it's medical oncology that takes the lead um, at our center in prescribing the novel hormone therapies. Um, uh, the urologists that we work with are, are very busy surgeons and uh, prefer uh, to, to focus on the surgical aspects of the patient's care. Um, so that's how it is, you know, at the Dana-Farber, but I understand um, that's not the case in most of the world. <laughs> Neil, can you talk a little bit about what really is going on in the real world, so to speak? Let's just focus on the United States right now in terms of, again, this interface between uh, urology and medical oncology. Yeah, I think it's a very important question. I, I think um, one key factor right away is, you know, the North Star has always has to be is what, and it, it seems trite to say it, but what will serve the patient best? Um, I think historically for in the arc of my career is what we've tried to do in the community is literally a, a mirror, mimic the best aspects of the academic multidisciplinary model. Um, 
But, you know, the business of healthcare has changed a lot in the U.S. We see a tremendous aggregation of practices. And urology practices started getting larger and larger over the course of the last 15 years. And that level of scale has allowed for subspecialization. And concomitantly, in the last 13 years, you see the, you know, the approval of immunotherapies and radiopharmaceuticals, uh, oral therapies, AR blockers, PARP inhibitors, the importance of genetic testing, and of course, taxanes. Um, you know, so what we're seeing now in a lot of the larger practices across the country, urology practices are of a fully employed medical oncologist within the practice, in addition to radiation oncologists, now even nuclear medicine radiologists because of PSMA PET. I mean, it's really getting, you know, fully developed. Uh, I also have always really stressed the importance of working hand in glove with your uh, the the nearby excellent tertiary academic centers, the ones who are doing some of the most cutting-edge clinical trial work. But a lot of the big urology groups are really embracing clinical trial work, um, and, and they're doing it well. They've learned a lot. I mean, and the, the key is, is, is being dedicated and not, it, it can't be a, you know, a dabbling or a dalliance. It has to be a full-throated approach. And I think Mary Ellen would agree with me that, you know, treating patients with advanced prostate cancer, and if I like to define it, the moment you fail, you know, interventional treatment, the moment you start a systemic therapy, in other words, T suppression, you've got advanced disease. And we've learned so much. It's not just, you know, hot flash and loss of sexual drive. There's so many other components to it. And having the complexity is, it's so important to be multidisciplinary. And um, there, you know, what works in a, you know, a community in South Carolina may not be the best situation in metropolitan Los Angeles. So, um, you know, I think it's a, it's an ongoing work in progress, but I, I honestly, I think we've learned a lot and we're, and the societies are working better together, you know, AUA and ASCO, uh, SUO, LUGPA, specialty network research uh, teams, and this it's only getting better for a very, very complicated field. It certainly is complicated, that's for sure. I mean, but it's a good news, though. So many trials have come out, I and mean, randomized phase three trials. You know, we never, I can remember thinking, we'll never see a randomized trial on M0 disease. Now, we're going to, today, we're going to talk about two big, really well-run uh, phase three trials, and there's more on the way. So I don't know about a general urologist trying to dive into this. I hear, you know, I know Mary Ellen, you've heard you know, there's data even that, uh, for example, hormone sensitive metastatic disease, it's hard to believe people are getting, you know, uh, ADT alone, but I hear it happens. And, you know, it's a complicated world to stay up to date with nowadays. That sure is. Well, let's, uh, Let's uh, get into some of the data, and then particularly I want to get into some of the decisions, the key decisions, and, you know, you know you'll know, you see in this survey, let's say there's a little bit of heterogeneity in how people see the data, and that's not unusual when you see big new data sets coming out. So, Neil, uh, first maybe you could just comment on the Stampede study. Maybe just comment on the Stampede study in general. Is this really amazing UK study that's had so many different arms over the years trying to understand prostate cancer. But this one in particular, uh, looking at abiraterone plus or minus enzalutamide, can you comment on what they looked at there, Neil, and what they found and what you think it means to us? Yeah, this was a, a wonderfully conducted study, as the Stampede leadership does just routinely. I mean, they really are setting the standard for basically the, 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 the mantra that every patient who comes in is a clinical trial patient until proven otherwise. I I just am amazed at how great they've done it in the UK and in Switzerland to doing this and the leadership of, of Nick James and Noel Clark and Gerda Tard and Silke Gillison and, and, and many others, many others. They've really just really, you know, setting the mark. So what they looked at here, essentially, it's a little bit complicated and I don't want to go into all the details, but essentially what they wanted to understand was if you're going to give um, ADT for a period of years, whether it was, you know, two or three years, and for high-risk patients, get radiation, 
would there be a benefit by adding either abiraterone or abiraterone plus enzalutamide to these high-risk localized patients? And then there you go. There's the KM. And uh, this was published in Lancet. I think this was probably the most significant trial that was reported back in ESMO of 2022, in addition to the, the very nice work done in the PRESTO trial. Uh, and what you can see here is a clear separation of the curve. Um, you know, a hazard ratio of 0.53 uh, when you it, it augment androgen receptor blockade by adding on uh, abiraterone. Uh, plus, the, the, the plus minus senzalutamide didn't really add much, but it was clearly the benefit was on uh, ADT plus ABI as opposed to a ADT alone with an MFS primary uh, um, endpoint. So, uh, Mary Ellen, any thoughts about this? And it seems like when you try to add, you know, abiraterone to one of the uh, androgen uh, signaling uh, and, and antagonists, it doesn't seem to add very much to it. I always reflect back on breast cancer. I know it's a different disease, but so many analogies there. You know, in the big ATAC study where they combined tamoxifen and aromatase inhibitor and astrozole wasn't any better than either one alone. Any thoughts about uh, combining uh, endocrine therapy, Mary Ellen, and, any, and how, have, uh, how has this trial affected the way you uh, manage patients? Uh, thank you, Neil. It was a big disappointment to me that um, combined therapy with uh, an AR antagonist and an uh, uh, androgen synthesis inhibitor uh, wouldn't be better than, than monotherapy with, say, an AR antagonist uh, alone. Um, and we, we saw that in multiple settings, right, in castration-resistant disease and then in hormone-sensitive metastatic disease and now in biochemical recurrence. So um, uh, it seems to be true. Um, personally, I think if we had um, more effective agents that could actually completely uh, block the androgen receptor or completely eliminate uh, synthesis of androgens that um, maybe we would make some impact with, with more combined uh, therapy. But I think these cells adapt early and develop uh, mechanisms of resistance. And what we're left with is monotherapy is, is what the data supports at this time. I think there's some kind of parenteral abiraterone-like agent being looked at. So I guess maybe the hope is maybe that might be a little bit different. Um, Neil, one of the issues here, is, and, you, and you're, you talked about the ATLAS study uh, that's uh, looking at apalutamide in this setting. It's an ongoing trial. Uh, interestingly there, they have a period where they get neoadjuvant apalutamide. Uh, any thoughts about that strategy? You don't see too much neoadjuvant therapy in prostate cancer. What do you think about that, Neil? Yeah, I, when we designed this trial way back, um, uh, Howard Sandler, myself, uh, uh, Matthew Smith, um, uh, a bunch of really other, Steve Friedland, several other, you know, great folks on the steering committee. And you, you can see we even had, you know, the use of, um, uh, uh, a first generation bicalutamide here. So a little bit of a run in, not particularly too long. You know, each cycle was about a month. Uh, but then ultimately, these were high risk of patients. So you're typically sort of more your grade group fours and fives. And then again, looking at, uh, you know, radiation with traditional hormone blockade versus traditional hormone blockade, now adding apalutamide. Uh, I'm, I'm very optimistic about this trial. I, I think that, um, this kind of, you know, dovetails the really nice work of Stampede. Um, and, and so I think it's, it again speaks to the notion around full androgen, for lack of a better word, maybe annihilation. Um, but as Mary Ellen does point out, there are some clonal uh, subpopulations that eventually uh, evolve. But uh, I mean, I think we're really looking forward to see if indeed this has a, a, a more effective cure rate uh, than just uh, the monotherapy ADT. Yeah, I love that word annihilation. Um, hopefully, it actually is going to pan out that way. And of course, uh, here's a, another study looking at enzalutamide in uh, that situation, which kind of gets into a, a theme, uh, Mary Ellen, of 
when you can substitute. For example, you have a patient who theoretically would have been eligible for stampede, high risk, localized disease, but they have brittle diabetes and you don't want to give them abiraterone. Uh, are you comfortable some, uh, switching to an anti-androgen or androgen blocker in that situation? Mary Ellen, have you done it? Uh, yes, I'm comfortable. I, th I think in the last you know 10 to 15 years since we've been using these drugs, while they haven't been compared head to head, um, the hazard ratios in the large trials are very similar with similar eligibility. Um, this Enzerad study was... Um, uh, performed out of, out of our institute led by Paul Nguyen. And I was surprised it wasn't, you know, positive across the board. I thought that was, you know, really what we were going to see, the positive data, at least at this um, look-see at the data, was in patients who had a PSA of 0 0.5 or greater. Um, so, but uh, yes, to answer your question, if I could not use abiraterone because someone had uh, diabetes or heart failure, then I would consider using an AR antagonist. And I've already done that, Neil. So. Well, let's talk about the two big trials just presented over this past year. First at ESMO last year, the uh, PRESTO study, androgen annihilation in patients with high-risk bicolumbically relapse disease. Uh, Neil, can you comment again? They looked at an apalutamide uh, and abiraterone arm there. It didn't seem to be much better, but uh, can you comment a little bit on the way this trial was set up uh, and what they saw there? Yeah, I think uh, Raul Agarwal did a great job in presenting it uh, in Paris last year. I think this is a, a really important trial. This is now one of two phase three trials looking at patients who've had, you know, BCR. Uh, and, and there's some different, there's some nuanced differences uh, within the inclusion criteria. One key thing is in both the PRESTO trial for BCR patients um, that they all had, a, and as well as Embark, they all had a, a doubling time of less than or equal to nine months. Conventional imaging, no PSMA PET, was the basis for f demonstrating no metastases. And this was a, a three-arm trial like Embark, but they had a monotherapy LHRH, I believe it was every three months, of uh, RMB, a combination LHRH and APA and RMC, interestingly, going back to a, a kind of a theme that you see in many of the developmental strategies within uh, Janssen Oncology was combining uh, ADT with APA and uh, abiprednisone. Uh, and so here you see the, um, you know, RMB is, is, is clearly a successful trial, a hazard ratio of 0.52, and they're um, you, you, this is, uh, you're really looking at the combination versus uh, monotherapy. I mean, they're really the biggest thing that they were able to come to in the early on was the PSA PFS uh, and demonstrating that differential. Um, and then of course, all, all, ultimately, you know, you do see a little bit more on the toxicity. I think it's your next slide. Uh, obviously, you know, there's never any free lunch in cancer therapies. You know, if you have one drug that's working and you add a second, there's always going to be a little bit more in terms of the, uh, the risk of, of, of known side effects. Uh, there wasn't anything really dramatically new in this as it relates to apalutamide, as there's been, you know, very good worldwide experience in the NMCRPC group and in the MHSPC group. Um, so I think this was also reassuring. I was really struck by the lack of treatment discontinuation you see down there at the bottom, all three of the arms, almost all the patients got through. Mary Ellen, uh, any uh, comments on this, particularly about the issue of tolerability of apalutamide? Um, Neil commented on the hypertension, of course you hear about the rash. Uh, and what are your experiences with this agent? Yeah, uh, apalutamide's very well tolerated. We, we manage a lot of hypertension, but we do that with all four of the novel hormone therapies. Uh, the rash, we have nice, um, clear algorithms to treat the rash that in the majority of times allow us to restart the, the apalutamide. Um, so in general, it's, um, you know, a, a very easy drug to manage. I, I agree, Neil. The, 
lack of dropout with a year of therapy was quite impressive across all the arms. I had quite a few patients on this to study, and I think as a field, we're getting better at listening <laughs> and trying to um, help people through their fatigue and their hot flashes and um, sexual side effects that um, do come along for everybody. It's amazing how often you see that um, you know, there are less people who have to stop therapy in general in a lot of oncology trials. The more people get to use it. Again, we were talking at uh, ASCO about uh, adjuvant therapy in uh, breast cancer of Bemaciclib, and the, the original trial, 27% of people had to have it stopped. Now, almost nobody gets stopped because people know how to do dose reduction, dose holds, et cetera. One of the issues that you commented on in general, Neil, with both of these studies is the lack of uh, uh, metabolic imaging, uh, particularly PSMA PET. And I'm curious, we asked this in the, uh, in the survey as well and actually got a heterogeneity responses. What do you do in conventional imaging in, the, in this typical same exact kind of patient who would go in the study, the conventional is ne negative, they've got a PSMA scan that's positive maybe even you know something that might be amenable to local therapy. But how do you approach those? Do you approach, Neil, do you approach those people like metastatic disease right from the start? Do you biopsy most of these people? Well, I think it's a really important question. You know, when we started this study and we designed it in 2014, uh, quote, next generation imaging, or you know, what some like to call today, molecular targeted imaging, essentially PSMA PET, I mean, was nowhere near, there was no accessibility to that in, in many countries. There were a few. And so everything was based on, you know, PCWG uh, recommendations regarding conventional imaging. And that is still pretty much the, 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 the state of the, of, of the state. Uh, but we realized that, you know, PSMA PET, whether it's gallium or fluorinated or some new ones that are coming along, uh, clearly have a, a much greater accuracy, especially in lower levels of, of PSA uh, um, uh, absolute values. And um, so it's, a, it's an area of, of great interest that we're going to, to look at. And to your point, if you get a scan that if you had conventional imaging and it was negative, and now you get a PSMA PET, and maybe you had one very convincing nodal pocket in the pelvis or you know somewhere that one could consider metastasis directed therapy whether node removal or radiation or an isolated bone lesion in the in the pubic area or an isolated in the axial skeleton would you consider doing you know SBRT and we have a lot of very nice phase 2 studies which support that but they're phase 2 they typically, when it's successful, it delays the need for testosterone suppression. Now, do you do those um, a focal uh, um, uh, targeted therapies with or without ADT? Do you do them with or without ADT in an AR blocker? Do you do them with or without an AR blocker alone? I mean, these are really great trials that are that are ongoing, and so. I think this is uh, very, very interesting, and, and it's an important area of, of continuing research. Marilyn, you've got the great interdisciplinary setup there. What's your approach been to these patients, and what kinds of uh, local therapies do you use to oligomets? Uh, we usually use radiation, uh, less than surgery, although a lot of other practices use surgery. Um, and we usually use uh, IMRT. Uh, in very small fractions, you know, one, two, or three fractions. Patients love it. Um, you know, the, of course, the patient's insurance has to cover it. Um, we've, in Massachusetts, found that I would say the vast majority of the time that it gets covered. Um, so that's what we generally use. So, Neil, we're about to also talk about the Embark study, the other big phase three trial with uh, biochemical relapse. But one big difference between the two trials was that Embark used intermittent therapy and Presto used continuous therapy. We'll get to that in a second, but I'm curious what your thoughts were about these data presented at ASCO from the Presto study showing uh, that patients who had a, a quick and deep PSA nadir did better in terms of uh, 
a you know longer term outcome. Uh, it looks like maybe at least two thirds of the patients actually did have a rapid uh, decline. Any comments on that general observation? And uh, I don't know whether you reported or not what fraction of patients uh, in the Embark study were able to uh, hold therapy with the, uh, I think it was 0.2 level that you established. Yeah, you know, the, you know, PSA as a biomarker, certainly as a screening tool for cancer, gets a lot of, you know, bad press. Um, and, and, and not inappropriately so, but if used judiciously, it's a, it's a good marker. Uh, but one thing that seems to be pretty clear is the profundity, the depth of PSA suppression, the declination or the nadir, whether it's in the great work that, you know, Maha Hussein did in the, in the SWOG trial and metastatic patients, clearly demonstrating that it was, uh, you know, a, a prognostic for survival. Uh, in the depth of, of PSA declination. And we see that in all three NMCRPC trials, Spartan, Prosper, Aramis. And I think we're seeing this uh, again in um, the BCR population. So, um, you know, the PSA becomes a very important marker uh, and that depth of, of nadir. Um, as it relates to uh, holiday, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, should we have holidays at 0.2 versus 0.3 or 0.4? I think that's an, you know, an area that's still relatively subjective. I think we'll talk more about the notion of holiday or intermittency, depending on the word you like. I, I like it very much. I like having it as an, uh, an option for patients for the associated quality of life benefit. Payers and healthcare systems may also see the value proposition because of the economic savings. I always like the I like the word holiday better than intermittent. Sounds more positive. You know, it's funny because in most a lot of the other solid tumors, they're grappling around with cell free DNA to really deal with the same things that you all have been dealing with for years with PSA. We were I was joking about that the other day. We were doing a program on colon cancer, and there. Cell-free DNA really is being incorporated into decision making, but I was just, you know, you know, contrasting it to what you had to do with your PSA. You're like light years ahead of what's going on there. One other paper from ASCO, I was curious what you all thought about uh, was, uh, you know, the whole issue of disparities is very interesting and important in oncology. And I've always been curious about uh, the biology of uh, prostate cancer in uh, black men, and uh, there's actually data presented by Dan George at ASCO looking at, as a prospective trial, I think it was about 100 people, uh, looking at uh, apalutamide abiraterone, um, and looked like uh, patients, uh, the black patients benefited more, they benefited. Mary Ellen, any thoughts about, any? do you have any vision for the endocrinology of prostate cancer in black men versus white men? Yeah, I mean, uh, the data has been presented similarly with um, Cipulus LT, right? And abiraterone alone, I think, small small cohorts um, with more benefit in African Americans. Um, I think we need to learn more about the biology. We do know that the androgen receptor, uh, there's a large part of the A exon that varies by race uh, and sets the activity of the androgen receptor. Uh, depending on this, uh, it's called the CAG repeat length. There was a lot of work done on this in the 1980s and 90s, and um, it may be something related to that, just the thermostat, if you will, of the androgen receptor in terms of activity and how these drugs uh, dock onto the androgen receptor. Uh, I imagine that that's, that's involved in, in the, some of the clinical responses that we see, but we need to learn a lot more, and it's really important to enroll diverse populations into these trials, and I congratulate these investigators on presenting this work. So I was telling Neil that, you know, there's certain things you, you experience in your life that you know you're never going to forget, and I will never forget when I first heard the Embark data, because I didn't read the press release carefully enough. I just figured it was another study showing intensification, and then when I saw the third arm there, I was like, whoa, that is really interesting. So Neil, let's talk a little bit about uh, what this study was and in particular how unique it was, not only 
As I mentioned, uh, everybody got intermittent therapy, but in particular, enzalutamide without ADT. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, yeah, this was almost really like two trials in one when you think about it. You know, we had combination AR pathway drug enzalutamide with traditional LHRH luprolide Q3 month uh, versus LHRH Q3 month with a placebo. And those, those two arms, uh, the blue and the orange box here, were, were blinded. Uh, in discussions with FDA, they wanted to see a monotherapy enzalutamide arm, and so that was that was added. Um, and these were patients who, like in Presto, a PSA doubling time less than or equal to nine months. And here's the KM. Uh, we see we see curve separation starting at about 18 months. Clearly, at three years, there's a differential, as you see, five years. And you know, this had a hazard ratio of 0.42, or a 58 percent less likelihood for metastasis and or death. Um, the death has not reached, its, the death rates, the overall survival has not reached statistical significance, but it's trending very favorably. We will be following those patients. And then when you look at the PSA, PFS, pretty much was the primary endpoint in Presto, ours is you know a hazard ratio of, of 0.07 in a favoring combination over LHRH monotherapy. And looking at the um, enzalutamide arm, you know, likewise, one sees the, uh, the, the hazard ratio not being 0.42, but still better than monotherapy ADT is 0 0.63. So uh, for... We know that about 30% of our audience has been in, the, uh, been in oncology, urology, less than a, a decade. So those people don't remember that the largest trial in the history of cancer treatment, not on GU, but in cancer, was actually a, an adjuvant trial of bicalutamide monotherapy. 9,000 patients were put on. Unfortunately, they were too low risk. They couldn't really make anything out of it. But I never thought it was ever going to come back, and yet here it is. And, of course, one of the issues here is now you've got a totally new player to consider in terms of uh, side effects and toxicity. So, Neil, maybe you can comment on what you saw, first of all, in terms of the combination arm and, for example, how it indirectly compares to what was seen with Presto. But in a particular, and I know you're going to be presenting a lot more data this coming fall at ESMO, what you saw in terms of tolerability with intermittent enzalutamide monotherapy. I'm wondering how many people in this audience have ever done that. What did you see there, Neil, that you can talk yeah, about? I'm, yeah, I think it's fair to say let the audience kind of scan through the, the percentages, the all grades versus the grade three and higher. A little bit more on the combination arm, but really not too dissimilar from what you'd see in combination versus monotherapy in the MCRPC trials like Affirm, post-chemotherapy, Prevail, pre-chemo, Terrain, Strive, uh, as well as in, uh, you know, um, Arches and arguably Enzimat in the MHSBC. I think of note, when you look at the Enza monotherapy arm, and this is the largest trial to date that I'm aware of that had taken patients, 354, and had monotherapy Enza, so no concomitant T suppression, um, we did the ANAC trial. We had 115 patients, and an earlier nice study done by Bertrand Tombal and Matt Smith had about 62 patients. So what we saw was co comparable. You, you do see when you have unopposed AR blockade and no T suppression, you'll notice you have more gynecomastia, nipple tenderness, nipple discomfort. Um, that That is clearly a, an effect of an AR blockade agent when you don't have concomitant T suppression. You know, I guess that's uh, androgens getting converted to estrogens. And they saw that in that big bicalutamide study. A lot of people got radiation therapy, like one dose of radiation therapy. How effective is that, Neil? And also you were telling me there's actually a surgical procedure that, that's pretty simple they can do. Yeah, so it's really interesting. I, I'm certainly not an expert on all the different ways to prophylax on these gynecomastic issues, but... Uh, one dose radiation outpatient basis is highly effective from everything I've read in terms of avoiding the, the gynecomastia. Now, there may be some, um, 
you know, economics behind getting that covered. Uh, there is even just the outpatient uh, a surgical procedure of, of just a sub areolar removal of the, 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 the breast tissue without affecting muscle. Um, there are some aromatase inhibitor uh, trials that are, or options as well. I think we're really at the learning beginning stages here because, you know, maybe we'll talk more about this with the, with the really nice survey that you, you've done is giving patients choice. So having the ability potentially to have an AR blocker such as enzalutamide, which is so well characterized over 10 years now throughout the prostate cancer continuum, but yet how can we mitigate these the gynecomastic issues and what are those strategies that we, you know, and I've just outlined a few of them. So uh, one of the reasons for interdisciplinary care is for people to talk to each other. And I really think this is a great situation for medical oncologists and urologists to be talking together. Mary Ellen, one of the challenging things here is you notice that even though I don't think they were directly compared theoretically, you know, statistically, that the hazard rate was uh, lower when you use the combination and monotherapy. I think it was 0.42 versus 0.64 or something. So you're not getting quite as much uh, anti-tumor effect. Um, although maybe you'll see a trade-off in quality of life. The reason I bring up breast cancer is we know that when you use uh, LHRH agonist in a premenopausal woman in the adjuvant setting uh, plus tamoxifen, you get a better hazard rate than using tamoxifen alone, and yet medical oncologists use tamoxifen in lower-risk people because they feel like the benefit doesn't outweigh the, the, the extra benefit in terms of tumor reduction is outweighed by the toler, you know, the t toxicity and tolerability. It seems like, I don't know whether we'll be able to access this treatment or not, it kind of seems like a similar situation here, Mary Ellen. Can you envision scenarios uh, where you might want to offer enzalutamide and monotherapy? Of course, when we see the data that's going to be presented at ESMA, we'll have a lot more granularity. But what would you tell a patient at this point in terms of what to expect in terms of side effects? Uh, versus uh, azalutamide monotherapy versus combining with ADT? Um, I would have frank conversation with the patient about the trade-offs in terms of, um, you know, the risks with either pathway, testosterone suppression or not, and possible, um, you know, small trade-offs in, in, in benefit. I, patients come to us with um, their own set of... Um, priorities and uh, preferences, and I think that's the magic of the clinic, right, that we get to um, uh, educate patients and uh, work with them to make the best choice for them. But I think it's a tremendous opportunity to um, uh, have this, this, this option without a trade-off compared to um, an LHRH agonist or antagonist possibly alone. I mean, it's the first time in 30 years in my career that I've seen monotherapy have a hazard ratio in, in more favorable than uh, medical castration therapy. I, I, I was very, I was surprised and pleased to see it, and I do think it opens new opportunities for us. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, it was it would beat ADT, which is what we've been using the last thirty years. You know, I was just sitting here thinking, Neil, you're, you're probably going to tell me there's already a couple of trials looking at this, but thinking back to what we were just showing about the APA and uh, the data from ASCO in terms of drop in PSA. What do you think about the possibility of starting ENZA by itself, see how, you know, how quickly the PSA drops, and maybe add in ADT if it doesn't drop quick? Yeah, I, it's, that's a, it's a kind of a data-free zone but for our trial. But yeah, I think that's a very interesting potential um, strategy. So I like that. Uh, I like Mary Ellen's comment about the magic of the clinic, and and I would just sort of dovetail that comment with still the joy of medicine that what we do, and I hope so many of our colleagues listening under you know they I, I know they appreciate that I I say that only in the context of so many colleagues feeling burned out in, in healthcare. But it's always great when there's educational events like what you do, Neil, and, and trials that were eight years in the making like this one. And then we can change clinical practice because that's ultimately why we do clinical trials. 
Yeah, we were thinking about putting together a program on burnout. And the more I talk to people, the more I realize that it's really the medical records and the insurance hassles, et cetera, that's burning people out, that people really thrive on the patient interaction. All right, well, let's jump into this survey. Uh, uh, we've done a number of these this summer, uh, and it's kind of a different technique. And it takes a, we found that it takes a little while to get it perfectly. We had 60 items on this survey. We're going to show you some of these. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be giving this survey out in the next year or two just to see what people are thinking that they're going to do. Uh, you'll get sort of some preliminary thoughts about that. This is our way of doing consensus. You, you know, it's kind of like the St. Galen thing that you, uh, that, that they do uh, with prostate cancer. So we say, what do you do outside a clinical trial? If everybody says the same thing, we call it a consensus. But we didn't see too much of that here. <laughs> so first of all, what kind of, let's start with something simple, maybe simple, but maybe not that simple which is preferred ADT, and we asked, and people gave pretty much the same answer, although I was wondering whether it was going to be different for M0 disease, where, you know, we've got this trial out there where they use the intermittent therapy, uh, but and people seem to, you know, have a way that they're approaching it, whether it's antagonist, agonist, oral or not, and they stick with it. But, Neil, uh, putting aside, you know, the things that you presented with Redlogolix in terms of cardiovascular issues and, and of course, the fact that it's uh, oral, is the issue of trying to use ADT in the setting of intermittent therapy, where you're going to see much quicker bounce back with the antagonists. Any thoughts about choice of, why do you choose Relagolix? Well, what are you thinking? And um, do you feel any differently when you're going to use intermittent therapy? Or do you think people should, Neil? Yeah. Well, I think theoretically, I've always um, uh, appreciated the superiority in a mechanism of action that is a, an antagonist versus an agonist. I mean, there's no compelling reason from a mechanistic uh, standpoint that you would give an agonist. I mean, there just isn't. And then that said, um, you know, a pill versus a shot. I mean, for most, I think they would prefer that. Um, and then particularly as it relates to um, uh, intermittency, uh, as your question uh, uh, suggests, the um, rapid uh, effect of an, uh, of an oral drug like Relagolix and then the rapid offset. I mean, you get quick T rebound. You don't get that lingering hangover parental oral effect from the agonist and antagonist. I, I think that's an important consideration. And I also do feel that there is a lot of circumstantial, but it's beyond circumstantial. There's a lot of, in my mind, particularly in populations at risk, that there is a cardiovascular uh, benefit. Now, we're, we, we need to do better prospective large phase three trials, and those are ongoing to look at that exact you know issue around uh, MACE, or major adverse cardiovascular event of agonist versus antagonist. That said, I, I use, still use lots of agonists, and I, I appreciate it for lots of different reasons, but when ch in asked in a survey to pick one, I figured I'd, I'd go, would go with a pick as opposed to no preference. So, uh, Mary Ellen, you know, it's interesting. They don't have relagolics or anything like that in breast cancer, which I have no idea why, you know, uh, in any event, uh, uh, I'm curious so uh, how you choose, uh, you uh, say LHRH agonist, uh, any kind of cardiovascular complications that you get you to think about an antagonist? Neil, that's because they have menopause and breast cancer. Well, yeah, but they still no. use a lot of LHRH agonists, that's for sure. I'm kidding. That was... Um, so I, I also use them all. Um, I, surprisingly, uh, and Neil may debate this, but you know how you have data from large, very controlled clinical trials, and then you get whatever compound out into the clinic. I have had multiple patients with suboptimal castration with regulolix. Shockingly, I don't know why. Maybe they're not taking it. They say they are. Um, and I also, when offer patients pills versus a shot, um, a lot of people do prefer a shot. So... Um, I don't think it's that, as clear as, as um, maybe Neil stated. Um, I use uh, Degarelix or Regololix in patients who have any kind of active cardiovascular concerns. Any CHF, 
uh, any recent stenting, any angina for which they take medications. And if I have any um, concern for any of those things, my patients all see a cardiologist and have any active cardiac imaging that they might need before I start. Um, that's gotten a little more challenging since the pandemic, getting patients who don't have cardiologists into, you know, semi-quick consultations, but, you know, you push the door, and I, I try to do that. Um, so that's, like, my take on it for now. But I, I think they're all good drugs. Whenever I order a PSA, I get a testosterone level. I think the teaching point here is when patients are on these kind of medications, you need to know where their testosterone is before, during, and after therapy. And I think that's something that's often um, left out of the management. Yeah, actually, you answered a question in the chat room from Dr. Kumar about uh, measuring testosterone. Incidentally, a comment in the chat room from, uh, I know, a medical oncologist in the Atlanta area, Dr. Priya Rudolph, says oncology is an awesome career. She had 48 patients on her schedule today, and she's still here on the webinar trying to learn more. Anyhow, I want to go through some questions. These are some of the kind of things we've been at. We, we, we did a survey like this, incidentally, for the bispecific webinar and for the pancreatic webinar that are coming up in the next week or so. Uh, and one of the things we like to do is get people's experience using different drugs, even if they've been around for a while. I'm just going to quickly go, go through this and show you what some of the considerations are with these uh, common agents. Uh, first, abiraterone. You know, can you come, you know, I kind of feel like I'm hearing people moving away from Aberator. Of course, it has the financial incentive there. Uh, but how do you generally approach the use of Aberator? And yet you say that maybe one out of five patients, you have to hold it, particularly for glycemic problems. Any comments about uh, your use of Aberator and whether it's decreased in the recent years, Neil? Well, not not really. I mean, you mentioned it, you know, the, the financial toxicity is a real event. And abiraterone, which is now generic, which and even if you're going to use generics, you, there, you can still, you know, half the dose and give it in a fed state as opposed to the non-fed state. Uh, so many of our patients are having problems with funding uh, for the more expensive uh, non-generic AR blockers. And it's a real issue. I mean, it, it, it just is. I mean, and if you're in the community, you're dealing with this on a regular basis. Um, I think, you know, the, the issues that, that you see listed on this slide and the slide before are all real. I mean, clearly checking, you know, for LFT abnormalities, although they're, they're, they're a small number, uh, yeah, I mean, if I, I'd be hard to start a patient, as Mary Ellen points out, who has, uh, you know, baseline, you know, hepatitis for whatever reason, infectious or alcohol derived, uh, unstable glucose control. I mean, I, an, an, an oral uh, or someone with AODM as opposed to fragile insulin dependent diabetes, that's a different, those are different patients. And of course, really, it's the fluid retention. I think everybody, you know, you're looking at these, they're all sort of in there. But, you know, this is a drug that's very effective, doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. Uh, the prednisone for some actually gives them a little bit of energy when they're fading. Um, yeah, I don't see the cognitive issues with Abby, but it is a little bit more intensive in terms of monitoring for potassium and LFTs. And so, uh, no, I'm, I'm still using it, and I, I think it has a role, and... Um, you know, I, I have I have that full throated conversation with all my patients uh, when it comes time to use any of the AR pathway drugs. So, Mary Ellen, here's what the faculty had to say about enzalutamide. Of course, again, we've talked about this for years. I'm really going to be curious to see what happens with people on intermittent enzalutamide monotherapy. First of all, you know whether or not they get any kind of cognitive issues, but particularly whether or not. It goes away when you hold it. Neil, did you observe that yourself in any of these patients where you thought was an improvement in kind of nonspecific fatigue when you, you know, you started uh, enzalutamide, but then you held it? Yeah, it's a, it's a fabulous. We're looking at that data right now, to your point. And, you know, we haven't reported on that yet. I mean, the nice thing about, you know, the, the Enza and APA, which cross the blood-brain barrier, is you can dose reduce. You can have a, an inter, a, a holiday. And I've had a lot of really good success with that strategy. I don't know if, if Mary Ellen's had the same thing. I think we're both in agreement that, you know, you, you don't see it in the majority of patients, but um, that there are strategies to, 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 to work around that. 
Mary Ellen, uh, any comments on that, on enzalutamide, also apalutamide? We were talking before about the tolerability issues there. Seemingly all of these seems like have similar predictions in terms of uh, whether or not you have to hold it or not. It seems, uh, you know, here, I don't know how much direct comparison we have at this point. Uh, it seems a perception being maybe less toxicity, less need for holding darolutamide. Any comments about tolerability profiles of these three agents, uh, Mary Ellen? Um, I'll just say when I see a new patient, I spend more time on taking a detailed medical history and getting to know the patient than I necessarily do on, on the prostate cancer history. I think you need to know your patient um, and, um, you know, knowing the top three um, or four side effects from these drugs is fairly easy, you know, because hypertension and fatigue are, are the top two <laughs> for all of them. Um, and, and, you know, and, and I do agree with the dose reduction uh, is always an option. On the phase one trial of enzalutamide, uh, we had patients when who were uh, on the lower doses who had excellent cancer control for years on um, very low doses, like 80 milligrams of enzalutamide. So, um, it's a very good tool to have in your armamentarium to consider dose reduction. Especially you might have a patient who has insurance coverage for just, you know, that one drug and uh, you want to make it work for them. So, Neil, you talked about, you know, substituting, for example, using uh, abiraterone instead of uh, one of the uh, androgen uh, uh, receptor blockers. We asked uh, the faculty also how comfortable they are uh, substituting one for another. So we've been talking about these two big phase three trials with enzalutamide and darolutamide. We said, well, suppose you couldn't get enzalutamide, would you be okay with the other two? I was kind of, I wasn't too surprised about apalutamide, but a little bit surprised that people would use darolutamide. I also wonder whether people use darolutamide without those attacks on hormone sensitive metastatic disease. Um, also, the question of you couldn't access apalutamide in the M0 situation. And here I was surprised by a couple of people who weren't like you, Neil, that comfortable substituting enzalutamide. So what are your thoughts about, uh, you know, if you can't access the drug you want, putting in another one, and particularly this issue of darolutamide? Yeah, I, I think that we have really great data when you look at cross comparable trials, although there's really a lack of head-to-head -head direct comparison. But if you look at the uh, the NMCRPCs where you have, you know, Darrow, APA, and ENZA, the, uh, the efficacy and the OS benefits are, are essentially comparable. Um, and, and likewise, if you look at Aracens and uh, Titan and uh, Arches in the MHSPC, granted, you know, Darrow in the uh, Aracens had the triplet, uh, I, I think that the, the tolerability, you know, one sees the some of the advantage of, of darolutamide. I think these are three clearly efficacious drugs, and that's why perhaps the faculty are so comfortable in, you know, interchanging, especially as it relates to any particular adverse event concern or, you know, sampling in their drug closet or, you know, reimbursement. Uh, regarding the use of Darrow off-label currently without uh, docetexel, I think that is being used. The good news is there are going to be two large trials that are going to read out in 2024. The Arisec trial, 200 patients, open-label, propensity match scoring to the monotherapy ADT arm from Charted. Uh, we'll have that data sometime in the first half of 2024, and that likewise a global ADT Darrow versus ADT monotherapy, the Arano trial, which was done outside of the U.S. for equipoise purposes, that'll also have a readout in 2024 just to balance the doublet opportunity for Darrow. You know, we, you know, I think it might have been Phil Kantoff, the first person. I, we have an embarrassment of riches now in the AR pathway armamentarium. So it's, it's good for physician patient choice and for access. So a few questions uh, related uh, to so uh, quality of life and particularly relating to the Embark arm, so to speak. Uh, so we asked a number of questions about side effects and quality of life related 
to those three treatments, those three arms. So either ADT, which was done intermittently, for example, with Relagolix, as Neil was talking about, intermittent ADT with enzalutamide or intermittent enzalutamide alone monotherapy. We said, what do you think we're going to see in terms of just better, quote, quality of life? And uh, a couple of people, actually you two both think the best quality of life is going to be intermittent ADT, although I would, would have guessed it would have been uh, Enza, which nobody actually says. But then we get into sexual function, which it's hard to believe there wouldn't be at least a difference in erectile function, if not libido. And it looks like a lot of, a number of people, well, actually, I call this pretty heterogeneous. Some people think all three are about the same. Uh, others think Enza is going to be better. Uh, we'll see what the data is. We asked how much of a problem you think the gynecomastia is going to be. And I have talked to a few people who are very, very concerned about it, but it seems like most people sort of think that it's going to be, you know, a challenge, but maybe not that difficult. Uh, we asked how effective we think radiation therapy would be. Uh, you say very effective. Mary Ellen says not. Again, a lot of heterogeneity. It's going to be really interesting. We're going to keep doing this survey over the, you know, over the future to see how we can, you know, present it to people better. Uh, this is interesting. So first of all, before we get to this question of whether or not you should offer uh, ADT, I'm sorry, enzymonotherapy, which you can see there's mixed answers. There's Half of the faculty says it really shouldn't be offered. Uh, so we've talked a lot about quality of life. We've talked about enzalutamide monotherapy. Any thoughts about what you're seeing here, Mary Ellen? It looks like, let's just say, that there's a lot of difference in th opinion at this point. Yeah. Um, I think the data is new. I think it has to settle in with people. I think it hasn't been, you know, approved as monotherapy by any regulatory agency. And I think some people are, you know, uh, hardcore practiced by the guidelines or, you know, other people are, um, you know, who live in this space, like understand the trade-offs and sometimes are comfortable with a more of a breadth of options that they can explain to patients. So I think it's evolving. I think it's just really early and that's why you're seeing this. Yeah, you're, that's such a great point because, you know, we, we see over the years so many new therapies coming in and you're exactly right. And with all this stuff kind of thrown up in your face, it takes a while to really digest. Talking about it, forums like this and many others are really helpful. It'll be a while before it starts to settle in. We talked before about the issue of PSMA positivity in the face of conventional imaging being negative. And again, you know, Maybe it's reassuring that you see this heterogeneity. So if you feel a little confused, you know you're not alone. But half the faculty says they approach it as metastatic disease. Half says they don't. Uh, we asked, we talked before about oligomets and uh, bone lymph nodes are the most common areas and usually radiation uh, therapy uh, to the oligomets. So... Uh, Neil, maybe we can talk a little bit about sort of the clinical application of what we were talking about earlier in terms of locally advanced disease and the addition of uh, in, or of intensified therapy or adding on to ADT. And incidentally, I'm trying to think of what are situations, at least in the castrate-sensitive situation right now, Neil, where you can justify using ADT alone. Yeah, a good question. I, I think if somebody is uh, a particularly um, frail, um, perhaps very, you know, it was elderly, and you wanted to do something, and you felt that there was some actuarial benefit, uh, and maybe they had many other comorbidities regarding cardiovascular, hypertension, glycemic control, uh, swallowing abilities cost concerns and they were and they were a poor performance status some initial short-term t suppression to see how they would respond that's probably the patient or i would consider monotherapy adt alone and that would probably be for somebody who um was more on the metastatic side um so yeah that, that would probably be in, the, in that category for someone localized 
Um, you know, if we're going to treat them and they were, are, are appropriate for therapy, I, I, I think you most likely are going to be a more on the based upon the level of evidence. You know, just one quick comment. You know, the Embark trial, we haven't even published it yet. So in all fairness to folks, I mean, uh, I, hopefully it'll be out pretty soon and people have a chance to sort of pour over the, the, the publication. So, and again, here, you can go through, this is the surveys in the chat room. Uh, there are a lot of questions in addition to the ones we're talking about here, the way people identify a high risk. Uh, and as you can see, mostly uh, abiraterone, as we were talking about before from the Stampede trial, uh, mostly, but you can see a lot of variation in the duration. I'm sure a lot of this is individualized as well. Um, we could go through a lot more of these. We have all kinds of scenarios we went through, but this is really just the beginning of what I expect to be a long process in trying to figure out how you all are really interpreting these fascinating new data. So I'm going to say at this point uh, a special thanks to uh, Neil and Mary Ellen. Uh, the audience, uh, thank you for attending. Um, we're going to be back on uh, Wednesday with Dr. Hutchings and Nastafal. I assure you it's going to be a very interesting uh, session on bispecific antibodies. Be safe, stay well, and have a great night. Thanks so much, Mary Ellen. Thanks so much, Neil. Have a great night.